Hey there, kids. It's me, Mr. Creepypasta. And before we get started on tonight's story, I'm yeah. going to let you know about Makeshift. Specifically, I'm going to let you know about the new limited edition Cyborg plush. If you guys missed out last year when I was selling Mr. Creepypasta plushes, now you can be able to get your hands on one of these new Cyborg plushes that are brought back from the dead. This plush is soft, cute, glows in the dark, and makes for a great companion when you're listening to nonstop horror radio or Creepypasta story time. If anyone out there is interested in picking up your own little bundle of joy, take a look at the link in the description down below, or you can head over to makeshift.com and check out their cyborg section. Keep in mind, he is only available for the next two weeks, so if you don't get him now, you can't get him ever. Makes for a great Christmas gift, makes for a great Christmas gift to yourself. And now, on to tonight's story. The back of Detective Guthrie's car has a very distinct smell. I'm no master of smells, but if I were asked to describe it, like if someone put like a gun to my head and said that they'd shoot me dead if I didn't give as good of a description of the smell in Detective Guthrie's car as I could, well, no, that, that wouldn't be much of a threat. Maybe if they held a kitten over a meat grinder. Yeah, so if someone held a kitten over a meat grinder and said they'd drop the kitten into the meat grinder if I didn't describe the smell of Detective Guthrie's car as perfectly as possible, I could tell them that it smells like this one time at the reception my aunt and uncle had after my cousin Susie's funeral when my uncle had too many grown-up drinks and started smoking and pacing around until my aunt lectured him on smoking indoors. So he went and ate a bunch of mints from the ornamental mint tray they always had by the front door and then he barfed into one of the potted house plants. If you were to say that that isn't a very clear description of the smell of Detective Guthrie's car, then I would say that you've never smelled a spider plant covered in mint menthol vomit before. What's with that face? Detective Guthrie asks me. What face? The face you're making. This is just my face. I unmake the face he's referring to. I was remembering something from years ago. Oh yeah? What was it? I don't really think you want to know. He probably thinks it's something related to pulling me out of that burning building. He eyes me in the rearview mirror. I know he's watching for signs of that face, whatever it was that I was making to pop back up. Detectives like to read your expressions. Not like a book. Maybe a picture book. One full of faces. Like if you curl your lip up into a sneer, it could mean you're thinking something mean about someone, or it could mean you farted. Detectives can tell which it is, although I suppose anyone with a working nose could too. And what's with that face? He asks. I toss my hands in the air in exasperation. I don't even know, okay? It's my little kid who almost died in a fire face. Just stop trying to read me and let's get to the station. Why are we just sitting here? We're parked by the river. I can never remember the name of the river. You'd think I would know it since I've lived here all my life, but to me, it's just the river. If someone says, do you want to go down to the river and catch frogs? There's only one river they're talking about, this one. There aren't many frogs to catch anymore, though. They got eaten by birds. There may be more frogs, that is, not birds. But if they are, it's probably hiding. You know, because they don't want to get eaten by birds. I'm not taking you to the station. Guthrie says in a low voice like there are other people in the car and he doesn't want them to hear. But you said you were bringing me in. He reaches into his pocket and pulls out a stick of gum. He unwraps it carefully, like it might explode if he opens it wrong. As he does this, he looks around with his eyes, but without turning his head, just sort of letting his eyeballs take in everything around him as if he's never been in the car before. Finally, he sticks the gum in his mouth, chews it several times, tosses the wrapper on the floor of the passenger seat, and looks at me. I think this guy is a police scanner. What's that? I ask. It's like a radio that lets you listen in on the frequencies we use to communicate. That's how he knew where I was? I think so. That would explain how he knew Jenkins had you in her car. How he found you after she got away from him. I have a suspicion that he's listening in on everything we say. I had no idea they made radios that let you listen to police chatter. I decide then and there that when I grow up, I'm going to buy one so I can listen to the secret stuff cops talk about like crimes and tickets and laws. That's assuming I live to become an adult. I guess I could also just become a cop and learn their secrets that way, but I don't really want to be one. A detective, maybe. But not like Guthrie. More like Sherlock Holmes. He had a cool hat with flaps on it. So if we're not going to the station, where are we going? I ask. Wait and see. I need a moment to think, and I'm not keen to just openly discussing plans right now. Especially with you. Hmm... 
That last remark stings a bit. I used to like surprises. When I was little, everything was a surprise. Birthday presents were surprises. Going places were surprises. And then I met Pasher, and no more surprises. That present from my Nana is one of those stupid dolls that makes num num sounds when you put the bottle in its mouth. We're not going to Disneyland, we're going to the hardware store. I started wishing for the excitement of being surprised by something again. Then that wish came true and cars started crashing and people burning up and parents going into comas and being kidnapped by witches. Me, not my parents. I was kidnapped by witches. Well, just one witch, really. The point is, whoever's writing this book of my life, you don't have to make up for the years of no surprises by going quite so extreme. Just a puppy I didn't know was coming would suffice. Or getting the toy at the bottom of the cap and crunch box for once instead of just crunch dust. After a long, quiet moment watching ducks do somersaults in the river, Guthrie starts the car, lets it sit idle for another minute while he combs his finger through his hair and listens to the chatter on the police radio, something about a car on fire, and then puts our car that's totally not on fire into D for drive and pulls away from the river, whatever its name actually is. He looks exasperated. That's a big word that means flustered or frustrated or aggravated. Those are also big words, so that probably doesn't help. Let's just say he looks tired and annoyed. Do you remember what I told you this morning? He asks in a tired and annoyed voice. Geez, did I see him this morning? It seems so long ago, like months. Let's see, I woke up, ate something. Oh, right, nasty, eggy waffles. Hiked over to my old house with Meredith. Oh yeah, we ran into him along the way, didn't we? He was in this very car, if I remember right. What did he say to me? He said, go home. That's right. There was probably more, but I wasn't really listening. Hopefully he doesn't do that thing where he presses me to repeat exactly what he said. Yes, I reply, avoiding smirking. What did I say? Oh, crap. He stares at me with that squinty look that says, I know what you're going to say before you say it, and it's the wrong thing, and I'm already prepared with a big, long lecture to give you on this terrible answer. I glance out the window at other cars going by. Is Tony the arsonist little girl killer in one of them? Is he looking for me? Sounds like he may be off setting cars on fire for some reason. Maybe he thought I was in that one they're talking about on the police radio? Was this, was someone in it? Should I keep my head down? Did somebody throw up back there after wolfing down an entire bag of Girl Scout Thin Mints? <gasps> All right, Guthrie is waiting. You said go home. I said not to hunt Gretchen Buttersquash's killer. And what did you do? I... didn't? Right. You just went back to your old home to perform an occult ritual to try and raise your parents from the dead, and in the process you ran into a boy and his mother who assaulted and kidnapped you. Then some sort of diseased dog showed up, tore the mother to pieces, bit the fingers off the boy, and you got away. He squeezes the steering wheel so hard I can hear the material it's made from creaking like a pair of overtight pants when their owner sits down. That's actually a surprise. Surprisingly accurate description of events, I admit. It leaves out that I was temporarily possessed and was the one who took David Clark's fingers, but I'm fine with that getting blamed on the dog versions of Mrs. Donovan. Do you have any idea how hard you make my life? He asks with another sigh. I think I have a pretty good idea. We pull onto a side of road that's not paved. Are we going to hide in the shack in the woods? No phone, no television, no electricity? I imagine spending the next several days sitting in a log cabin with one of those toilets that's just a hole cut into the floor. I bet there's rats and spiders living there. In the shack, not the hole. Well, maybe the hole. Oh god, I don't want to go to the bathroom into a rat-filled hole. Just as I start to sweat at the thought, we pull off the dirt road and back onto a paved road and the whole idea of hiding out in a shack vanishes in a puff of smoke. I can see the sign for the Red Moon Hotel and I don't even need Pasher whispering in my head to tell me that's where we're going. Of course we are, because life is like a bicycle wheel and we just keep going round in circles like a dead squirrel caught in the spokes. The rat toilet idea suddenly seems much more appealing. The Red Moon Hotel is where I went a couple of years ago when the angels tasked me with killing Meredith. She wasn't my best friend at the time, we're like third, but that's not important. Isn't there another hotel in town? Why does everybody end up at the Red Moon Hotel? Maybe their rates are really low because of all the little kids getting strangled by shadow angels. 
Please tell me we're not going there, I say. Do you really think he won't check the hotels? Are there even any other hotels around here? He might even be checked into this one. I already scouted it just before we got the call about the shooting. We're good. Even though he says this with his typical air of confidence, he slows down and seems to become hesitant to pull into the hotel parking lot. He looks at me in the mirror again. Did you get some sort of premonition? I want to lie to him and say yes. No. Oh, stupid mouth. Weren't you listening? We park in one of the handicapped spots. I'm not sure if Detective Guthrie just doesn't care, didn't notice, or thinks I count as disabled in some way. The hotel looks pretty much the same as the last time I was here, aside from the charred remains of a telephone pole that looks hastily fastened to a freshly installed new one. I guess taping a new pole to the old one was easier than unhooking everything up in the telephone lines and pulling the burnt pole out of the ground and putting a new one in. Still, I can't help but feel a tiny bit anxious about the possibility of it falling on me as I look up at it. Friend of yours? Guthrie asks me as he gets a shopping bag out of the trunk of his car. Just another innocent bystander, I murmur. We get room 36. I'm not even kidding. This is the exact room as when the angels tried to make me kill Meredith. Did I die? Is this hell? Because I actually did kill Meredith back then, and the past two years have been my punishment. Now I'm cursed to live her life. No family left, the exact same foster parents, and now this exact same hotel room. If a younger version of me comes riding up on a bicycle, I'll just roll over and let Duma choke the life out of me. That almost sounds like a huge relief. Are you Satan? I asked Detective Guthrie as he unlocks the room and starts checking the bathroom closets and even under the bed. He frowns. Is there really a Satan? That's a good question. I shrug at him, but I keep thinking about it. Samuel seems kind of Satan-y. So does Duma at times. Who runs the show down in the pit if there's no Satan? Maybe it's just the demons. Speaking of which, I need to get home and send Furfur back. Oh, geez, if they make me stay here for weeks, my bedroom closet is going to smell so bad when I get home. Guthrie dumps out the shopping bag onto the bed. There's clothes and toiletries inside. I don't know why they call things like toothbrushes toiletries. Brushing my teeth and the word toilet should never go together. Ever. Especially brushing your teeth and rat toilet. Oh my god, I hate my brain sometimes for thinking of these things. Look, Lily. Detective Guthrie says with a sigh as he sits on the edge of the bed next to the pile of clothes. I know you've got no respect for authority. I turn quickly. What do you mean? I totally respect authority. No, you don't. Now shut up and listen. I'm too shocked at his sudden sternness to argue further. You don't respect authority, that much is clear. If you did, we wouldn't be here now. I want to argue again, but instead I just ask, how so? I can feel the skin on my lips so dry and cracked it's starting to peel. I bite it with my teeth and rip it off. The sting of it actually feels kind of good. He stares me down. His eyes are a really dark brown and I can't help but try to focus on one and then the other. People say look me in the eyes, but eyes are too far apart for me to look in both of them. I can only look in one eye. Maybe if I stood really far back? From everything you've told me, every time your angel friend told you not to do something, you went and did it anyway. <laughs> I scoff. Not every time. There were a lot of times, though, I have to admit. And every time, you didn't listen. You got into big trouble. I live a very crazy life, and someone else paid the price. My jaw clamped shut like one of those bear traps in cartoons. If my tongue had been sticking out, I might have bitten it off. Wouldn't that be a sight? The girl snapped her mouth shut and bit her tongue off. Don't look at me, I was just talking to her. Maybe if I did bite my tongue off, I wouldn't be stuck in this personal hell that is the Red Moon Hotel. Guthrie nods grimly. That's right, it's never you. I'm not saying this to make you feel bad. My jaw unlocks. Well, it does. But it's high time you considered the consequences of ignoring other people's advice. We know each other pretty well by now, don't you agree? I mean, as well as I know anybody these days. It's true, Guthrie has probably acted more like a father figure to me than Mr. Lake has. Mr. Lake, who fights with his wife over the sorting of teas and eats dinner in the living room on a TV tray so he can watch some show from England where people chase each other around while someone plays a saxophone. With Meredith gone... My parents gone, Jamal all the way across town and his dad thinking I'm evil, not to mention I punched him earlier today. 
There's really been no one to talk to except Detective Guthrie every time he picks me up from wherever I've gone. Mrs. Lake tries, but she only wants to talk about doilies and cooking and gardening. She's not interested in painting still lives or playing the drums. Sometimes, I wonder if she was ever a child or some sort of waffle-making robot they turned out of a factory. Yeah, I guess, I mutter. Guthrie nods and smiles for a moment and then goes back to serious mode. Maybe he's a robot too, a detecting robot. Well, I don't want to become another casualty, you get me? Andrew Guthrie is going to survive this Lily Madwip adventure. Don't call it that, please. <laughs> Stay in the room. He points at me with his finger and says this with a really commanding tone. Don't go out to explore. Don't call anybody. Don't even open the curtains. This hotel room is a bunker for all intents and purposes. You will remain here until this Tony guy is caught. I can feel a lump in my throat. I try to swallow it, but it resists. I cough to try to drive it up into my mouth, but again it resists. I guess it's going to stay there for now. What if he's never caught? I say hoarsely, stupid throat lump. Guthrie stands up, adjusts his tie, and in doing so flashes his gun in its holster at me. I think he did it on purpose. Believe me, he says. This guy shot an officer. He is not getting away. He heads toward the door, and then stops and turns back to me. I've got someone stationed outside in an unmarked car. Do not look at them. Just believe me that they're there. You're going to be okay. You can order room service, but don't go crazy. I'm paying for all of this. I'm a detective, not an oil tycoon like those people in Dallas. Just sit back and watch TV. Let us do our jobs. Lock the door behind me. Wait! I cry. Whose clothes are these? They're yours. He leaves, checking in both directions before shutting the door. I hear him drive away a minute later. These are not my clothes. I separate them out from the pile and look at them carefully. Most of them have store tags on them like they just got bought. I don't want to sound ungrateful to Guthrie for buying me clothes, but when did he even find time to do this? The shirt has sequins and a really lifelike horse soon on it with the words, Live to Ride. What am I, nine? If I wear something like this to school, I'm going to get ridiculed or beaten up. Oh, I'm not going to school. The realization slaps me like a hand. I'm, I'm too exhausted to think of a better analogy. Oh, I'm not going to school. And I get to watch the TV. I almost never get to watch TV. The last cartoon I even remember seeing was years ago when I was invited to a slumber party by this girl, Rachel, who I was friends with, before I told her that her dog was going to die. We stayed up all night eating popcorn, which got between my teeth and gums and made my mouth hurt. And the next morning, they watched this cartoon about a woman who runs an orphanage, but is a rock star on the side and can make herself look different using holograms. I don't remember the name, but she had a boyfriend who was way too possessive. I was mostly interested in the holograms, but apparently hologram technology isn't anywhere near where the show made it seem. And that was it. That was the last cartoon I can remember watching. I turn on the TV. The channel it's on is just some big, long, scrolling list of other channels and what's on them. I don't know what anything is. There's lots of news channels, something in another language, probably Spanish. Everything else is just letters. CBS, PBS, CNN, ABC. That's probably the learning channel for little kids. It's getting late and the sun is already setting. I can see just a sliver of orange light turning pink and purple through the curtain. I think about peeking out, but Guthrie's words about me never listening make me hesitate. Do what you're told, I say to myself. Were they going to bring the lakes here eventually? Is Guthrie coming back to watch over me himself? He didn't really just leave a kid to her own devices in a hotel room, did he? Is that even legal? I hope he doesn't lose his job because of me. I hope Officer Jenny doesn't lose her eye either, but I, I know she will. At least she's just losing the eye and not her life. When I saw her eye all red earlier, I got what it meant wrong. I don't know what's up with my ability to see things before they happen today. I try to use it and my head fills with painful static. I don't try to use it, and I get the messages wrong. Something is, well, wrong here. Out of sheer boredom, I check my pockets, but they're mostly for show. 
The paper bag with the stupid baby clothes in it and toothbrush and toothpaste also has a small journal for me to write in and a ballpoint pen that has the letters HSBC on it. I write a bit in the journal, mostly short poems about raccoons and roses because those words are easy to rhyme. And then I play a game called What Does HSBC Stand For? I decide that it must mean Haverhill Sandy Beach Center, which I'm pretty sure we don't actually have here. This is like the middle of nowhere. The ocean is miles away. I draw a demon, but it looks too much like the one from a comic book than a real life one. The phone rings at one point around 7 p.m. I'm eating a small bag of pretzels I found in the nightstand and reading the Bible that was also in the nightstand. I don't remember if Guthrie said whether or not it was okay to answer the phone. What if it's Tony? Oh, hi, Lily. I was just calling each room to figure out which one you were in before I come to stab you to death. Oh, hi, Tony. I'm in room 35. I would lie. But I just called room 36, he'd say. And then the door would crash in and he'd walk in carrying Guthrie's severed head and throw it at me, splattering my face in these stupid unicorn pajamas I put on against all better judgment with blood. And then he'd jump on me and stab me with this loud re 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 sound screamed in the air. At least that's how movies make it seem. I pick up the phone and put it to my ear, but say nothing. Lily, it's Detective Guthrie. Oh good, you're not decapitated. Silence. After half a minute, he says, I'm going to ignore that. Have you had dinner yet? I got some Chinese food I can drop off when I get off work at the end of the hour. Are you going to stay here? I ask in as meek a voice as I can. I don't like being here alone. I feel like I'm on the dark side of the moon. The red moon. The dark side of the red moon hotel. Oh crap, I literally am on the dark side of the red moon hotel. I can stay for a while. How does that sound? I'd rather you just not come over if you're going to leave again. He's quiet for a while. I understand. He says finally. I know this is probably really scary for you. I reach down and scratch at my sock because something stiff is in it. Not my foot, something else. I pull the sock down. Oh yeah! I stuck my foil Charizard in my sock! I don't even remember when I did that. Sometime after my first meeting with David Clark. I'm not scared, I'm... Bored? No, frustrated because I want to go deal with that demon I left trapped in an egg in my bedroom closet at the lake's house, and I can't. Bored. Okay, fine, Mouth. Whatever. Well, watch some TV, okay? If you don't want me to check on you tonight, I'll check on you again in the morning. He hangs up before I can whine anymore. My Charizard is warped slightly by being pressed against my leg. I put it on the nightstand and place the Bible on top of it to try to flatten it out. I'm not going to lose you again, I tell it. I turn on the TV and watch the scrolling list of channels until I feel my eyelids getting heavy. I didn't even brush my teeth yet. I'm too late. I fall asleep the wrong way on the bed and my last thoughts as I drift off is to remember to wake up before Guthrie comes over in the morning because I don't want him to see me in these stupid pajamas. We're coming around the bend to holidays. Which means that I'm going to tell you guys about a book. <laughs> Actually, I'm going to tell you guys about two books. The Creative Pasta Collection, Volume 1 and Volume 2. It's available on Amazon right now. You can find a link to it in the description down below, and they are books that are curated by me. They're a couple years old, but recently one of them got published in Japanese, which is interesting. I don't think you can buy it, but... I mean, if you're in Japan and you see it, I, I hope you think. And as always, I want to give a big thank you to everybody who supports me on Patreon. That includes everybody who's been waiting... <laughs> for me to update my Patreon, and I thank you all so, so much for being so patient with me. But especially, I want to give a thank you to Jordan Alexander Sanchez, Jacob Fenske, Stephanie Butler, Bobby Carmen, Chance Burnett, Tanya Krause, Tristan Pelton, Acid System, Adam Garrick, Aaron Stormcrow, Aka Limchok, Amber Clark, Angelus, Atomorous, Bastion Beefcake, Blue the Enigma, Braden Morris, Broken Beast 320, Captain Scurvy, Caspian, Shelly J, Corey Tension, Cronut 509, Crusader Chocobo, Cryptic Nightmares, Curse Pox Primark, Dakota Lane Whetstone, Daniel Polson, Darth Miver, Deleted Account, Dirt Diver 030, M, Esteban, Fester's Lampshade, Freddy Krueger, Goreg Tri Magazine, Grand Moth the Milky, Hades Nephew, Happy Birthday Jason Wilson, Harley, Himbo Jerry, Horseman Set Time, Insanity Game Rex, Jake Cairns, Jesus Cornell, Jordan Humble, Justin LaFontaine, Kaylee Ambrose, Kiri the Sloth, Crazy Kid, Cryolinian, 
Lambda M98, Lisa Cottrell, Little Crow, Lord Life's Best, Lupita Galvin, Love You Eminem, Matt Bach, Melted Lake, Michael Allen Jr. Bashirs, Mike, Mr. Marcus Blitz, Nate Cull, Nico Kyle, Psychomo, Red Shadow Cat, Rob Like Sharp Things, Sam Ahai, Sashi Sasaku, Seclude, Stricken, Tali Sue, Tater Chip, That Creepy Chick, The Ginger Bros, Turtle Man, Voice of Sand, William King, Xavier and Cheyenne, Yargul, and Zachary Graphius. If you'd like to join this list of names that I horribly mispronounce, then please head over to patreon.com slash mrcreepypasta, or you can always check out the names in the description down below, and I appreciate it infinitely. So thank you all on Patreon. Thank you all so, so much. And to everyone, sweet dreams. <laughs>